The skies over New Phyrexia crackled with otherworldly energy. The scheming of a power from before the mending, with endless roots and countless lives, threatens everything and everyone with harmony. The Phyrexians wish nothing but peace and unity for all lives throughout the multiverse. All we must do is see the truth, succumb to the one. Still, there are those malicious enough to stop this benevolent future, selfish individuals. Planeswalkers. The Edict of Elish Norn will come to pass. This is Phyrexia, and all will be won. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Ether Hub. I'm Sybin, bringing you more Magic the Gathering lore. Today, we celebrate Phyrexia All Will Be One with the complete story that takes place in this set. From the cards depicting the gut-wrenching fates of some of our favorite heroic planeswalkers, to the machinations realized by the most terrifying villains in MTG, this is everything that happens in Phyrexia All Will Be One's lore. This is a recap of all my videos relating to this set's story, combined in a single video so that you can get all the lore in one place. Before we begin, I just want to give credit to the authors who wrote the stories for Wizards of the Coast. The material is produced across several side and main stories of Phyrexia All Will Be One, as well as The Brothers War. So, shoutouts to Shauna McGuire, Reinhardt Suarez, Langley Hyde, and Laura Gray. If you enjoy our videos here at the Ether Hub, be sure to click that like button, become a subscriber, and of course, share it with your friends. Now, the complete story of Phyrexia All Will Be One. Nyssa sat at a meeting table at Urza's tower, where Chandra was informing everyone that Innistrad and Amonkhet were shoring up their defenses and sending their civilians into hiding. The multiverse was preparing for war, preparing for the coming Phyrexians. Jace Balaren had been recruiting more to help their cause, and Tyvar Kell, a prince of elves on the plain of Kaldheim, who seemed to be allergic to shirts, had answered his call. When Jason and company were all gathered, they would come to the tower and rendezvous with Tefiri and then make their way to New Phyrexia, while Chandra Nalar would wait at the tower with Liliana Vess as backup. The Mirans on New Phyrexia, those mortal souls resisting the Phyrexians, had allied with Urabrask against Elish Norn, and would launch their offensive soon. Elish Norn's plan was to use the seeds of Kaldheim's World Tree to bind all the planes of the multiverse to New Phyrexia. As they argued over the implications of what destroying that world tree would do to New Phyrexia, Tafiri appeared in the doorway. Chandra wanted the entire plane to be wiped out with the tree, disregarding the lives of the Mirans, who were the original inhabitants of the plane, and were fighting for their home and survival. She wanted them all to suffer. But Nyssa had to remind her that not everything on the plane was lost. Kaya and Sahili went back to the workshop with Tafiri, leaving Nyssa and Chandra to argue amongst themselves. Tafiri had been testing for a month with Sahili and Kaya. They would plant secret phrases for him to find, gradually going back in time farther and farther, making sure nothing was changed by the presence of a spirit. Kaya was his medium. She was in his head, able to transmit information to her without returning to his physical body or current time. Urza had been the one to discover that Silver could travel physically back in time, but Sahili had found a clever way around that restriction. Tafiri didn't need to go back himself. He just needed to see what happened. He traveled as a spark, able to observe without interacting with the events of the past. Kaya asked if he is ready. After he nodded, Tafiri felt the coffin, the pod in which his body sat, grow hot. He never got used to the feeling of the temporal anchor ripping his spirit and his spark from his body. The group had conflicting accounts and information about the Golgothian Silex. Karn had thought that the one Ajani destroyed was the true artifact but Tafiri had uncovered several stories of it being destroyed in multiple ways in the past. No one could be certain of which Silex was the one that Urza used to end the Brothers' War, so they would have to make do with the replica that Sahili had created. Tafiri felt his physical body slip away and found himself looking over a number of scrolls, etchings, papers, and manuscripts on a table in front of him. Among them was the Antiquities War written by Urza's wife, Kyla Ben Krug. There were many translations and versions of Kayla's accounts, but they all told Tafiri he needed to go to Argoth, where Urza had activated the Silex. Back at 63 AR, a black sky, oil-slick waves crashing on the beach, pulling dead bodies onto the sand. 
two giant constructs were collapsed across each other. Littered around them, metal ruins twitched. This was the last battle on the island of Argoth, moments before the Silex blast. Phyrexianized Mishra laughed, Urza wept, and the Silex flashed. Time froze. Tafiri knew that commanding time was a dangerous power, one he was careful to wield, but he still didn't know how Urza activated the Silex. They simply took notes and made guesses. There were far too many variables to duplicate. He would have to align his time with Urza's, though it carried with it a terrible risk. Tafiri knew that Urza did not die when the Silex detonated, but that didn't necessarily mean Tafiri's spirit would survive the blast. The Silex was more than just a bomb. Every important event came after this moment. Tafiri's family came after this moment. He stopped holding back time. The multiverse tore open. Everything came after. What remained of Urza's tattered body still sat cross-legged on Argoth. The Silex on his lap was filling with light, frozen in bloom. Then blank nothingness in all directions. Tafiri walked over and sat across from Urza. I need to tell you something about the future, Tafiri said. Your future, my present, it concerns everything. The two, mentor and student, though not here, not now. To Urza, he was nothing more than a stranger in the void, a spirit, a guide to the afterlife, or at least he thought. Urza asked for his name. Tafiri brushed off the questions. He had his own to ask. Tafiri didn't know if talking to Urza would change anything, or worse, change everything. He had to take that chance. Tafiri told Urza that the Phyrexians were back in his time, threatening the multiverse, about how Sahili had remade the Silex. They just needed to know how to use it. Urza sat back down, picking the Silex up again. His body began to fall away once more. Then, the Lattice of Light rebuilt him. Tafiri remembered the power that Planeswalkers had before they gave it up to Men Dominaria, a power that Urza would possess now. The body was only a vessel for the spark. Tafiri understood. There was no spell, no ritual or secret mechanism. The trigger to detonate the Silex was a person. Back on present day Dominaria, Ren and Nyssa reached Sahili's workshop, finding the stone wall around the door torn down and a thick black smoke filling the chamber. Nyssa could see two figures standing around the temporal anchor and summon wind to blow away the smoke. She was ready to summon Gaia's elementals, but as the smoke cleared, she saw the core lithomancer, Nahiri, and Jace Balaran, the mind mage. The machine had suffered considerable damage. Its power stone core had failed and imploded, causing debris to cover the coffin in which Tafiri laid in stasis. Jace asked if Tafiri was able to figure out how the Silex worked. Kaya had seen and felt everything Tafiri had. She was his medium into the past, the one tethering his soul to the anchor. But the events were cryptic. She heard Urza speak, and could recall the conversation, but was there more she wondered? Tafiri was still inside the stasis capsule that he referred to as a coffin, so they all cleared the path of wreckage to make it to him. Kaya knocked on the capsule, then cupped her hands to peer inside the small window. Tafiri was inside with his eyes closed and a distressed expression on his face. At first, they thought he was pale and sickly, but that wasn't it. He was disappearing. Ren noted that Tafiri's song, his very being, was tied to this machine. He could not leave it, or he could be lost forever. Until he was fully restored, this is where he would stay. Elspeth Terrell appeared in the doorway with an injured Joda slung over her shoulder. She sat him down in a chair and handed him a small flask. He was still reeling from the strike of Rona, whose glaive had cut deep into his midsection. Luckily, Elspeth's magic had ensured it wasn't mortal. The Mirren attack on New Phyrexia was almost underway, so most of the Planeswalkers would leave Joda and Ren to try and figure out how to free Tafiri. Now others began to Planeswalk into the tower. Vraska, the Golgari Queen of Ravnica, the Wanderer, the Empress of Kamigawa, accompanied her childhood friend Kato Suzuki, the militant man Luka from Ikoria, and of course, the shirtless Tyvar. Chandra had left earlier that day for Kaladesh to visit her mother. Nyssa wished to speak to her again before marching into New Phyrexia, but that would have to wait. Nyssa watched all the others with her in the room. Friends and strangers from multiple planes assembled just as the desperate people of Dominaria had come together, overcoming their differences and forging a united front. There was something beautiful in that, something Nyssa had not considered. The struggle against the Phyrexians was not only for the Gatewatch to undertake. All beings that hoped for a future had to decide to fight alongside those who would have been enemies, or let Phyrexia turn the multiverse into a bleak wasteland. 
This is what Nyssa sought as she looked at Nahiri, someone who she had just fought on her home of Zendikar. They disputed on the best way to heal their broken world. Nyssa had come out on that conflict, and still Nahiri had arrived, all the same looking to protect the multiverse. Everyone going to New Phyrexia gathered around Jace, for the life of every plane, they would all keep watch. Tefiri awoke on a beach, laying in the sand, feeling it sting his eyes. A crab scuttled across his left hand, he felt it. Tefiri sprang to his feet, he was no longer a spirit. He felt rested but confused, he wasn't in the temporal anchor. Tefiri looked across the coast stretched out over the horizon, to his left rose a rocky cliff, to his right the beach stretched on. He tried, but he couldn't connect to Kaya or the Temporal Anchor. He couldn't go home. He could only hope that they had gotten what they needed from his conversation with Urza. He struggled to remember. He had already begun to forget. This was no time to panic. This was just another obstacle. He looked across the sand and saw footprints where people had treaded. If there were people here, there was hope. Tefiri stood up and started to follow the footprints inland. The dawn on New Phyrexia shines light on a world of Elish Norn's design. She, through guile and strength, had become Regent, the mother of machines. Her machine orthodoxy now reigned supreme, a twisted religion that held Phyrexia's glorious purpose as its sole belief, and glistening oil as its sole holy relic. She walks across the fair basilica, the courtyard where she commands the endless thralls of the Phyrexian faithful. Beings once unpure by flesh and individuality, now perfected in her image. Machines, whose synthesized voices cry out in unity under her direction. It was perfection. At her dais, clad in her armor, milky white like porcelain, she addresses the masses. Their consciousness, their will, tied to her own. It's a display of vanity more so than one of leadership. She had made these Phyrexians, adopted them from the moment they emerged from their birthing pods. While her splicers sliced away their fleeting strands of humanity, she indoctrinated them into her order. Today would be another glorious day. On display were Mirren prisoners, subjects who refused the blessing of perfection in favor of their curse of flesh. A blasphemous act that couldn't go unpunished. But Elish Norn was anything but merciful. She would show that to her congregation. These Mirans would be folded into their flock by Norn's own hand, given a second chance at perfection. Glistening oil was the sacred ingredient that would perfect the multiverse. From Elish Norn's own being, it was the purest, most potent source of this substance. She stabs into her own wrist and holds it above the struggling Mirren. The oil bubbles forth viscous, and covers the human from head down. She gurgles as it enters her throat. She screams as it pours through her eyes, nose, and ears, every possible entry point. Soon those very mortal screams would be replaced by the harmony of scraping metal. This oil would replace their free will, their individual mind, their fears, desires, everything that made them human, or in Elish Norn's terms, made them disgusting. And it's replaced by the One. Later, her body would be transformed by the Splicers who would rip flesh from bone and replace it with perfect metal. But this, the glistening oil, was the first step of the process. As Elish Norn expected perfection, she was taken off guard when the Mirren's body trembled and convulsed. The oil was blessed. It did many things, but not this. It wasn't the normal reaction. There was no sign of change, of machinery only corruption. The body burst from within. Long, tangled roots made of congealed blood sprouted down and into the ground. It was as if a tree had exploded from a compressed vessel. Elish Norn had prepared for a multitude of contingencies, even the unbelievable scenario where her oil did not complete the subject. But this, this was impossible. As the Mirren continued to plant itself through the stone of the metallic Fair Basilica, her prized temple, the Praetor could feel her subjects begin to wane. They felt doubt, just as she had. Elish Norn ended the display with a swift strike to the Mirren's throat, leaving her body lifeless and pierced by these roots. In her speech, she attempted to salvage the ceremony, explaining how the creature was so unholy, unpure, corrupted, that even the oil could not save her. In truth, 
Elish Norn was uneased by this display. How could the glistening oil, the holiest of substance, fail her? Oil from her very veins. Was she, was she somehow corrupted? For the first time, a praetor felt doubt. Later that night, walking back to the place of this botched procedure, Elish Norn thinks back on the possibilities of such a reaction. Certainly no human was strong enough to resist her oil, let alone respond in such a biological and blasphemous way. Perhaps there were clues at the ritual site, something she may have missed amongst the confusion. There, where the Marin's blood had spilled, a small plant had taken root. An insignificant thing, but a tarnished stain on all which she had built. An organic thing was corrupting her palace of stone and metal. She grabs the stem with her cold, clawed hand and pulls hard. She's met with uncanny resistance from such a small thing. Using all her strength with both arms, she yanks and frees the abomination. Where she expected to find roots, she found something else. Connected to the plant was a human arm, growing from the tendrils of the stem and latticed with the muscle and flesh. It was truly the most disgusting thing she had ever witnessed. Flesh had cursed her perfect world. In a rage, she shreds the organic matter in a masterful display of precision, satisfied that it would no longer taint New Phyrexia. But as she looks across the courtyard, every drop of Mirren blood had sprouted another plant. They littered the area a field of green. From plant to plant, she disposed of this corruption. A plant tied to a thigh, a lung, a heart, teeth and ears. All pieces of a disgusting, biological life form. An uneasy, unfamiliar feeling coiled through Elish Norn's chest. The darkness that plagued her sky coalesced and took form. Horns whisked with a shadow that draped down into a slender form. A planeswalker. One who Elish Norn had heard of from reports gathered from the Mirren Resistance. The fleshlings reported a humanoid who plagued their dreams, twisting them into nightmares. A mage, no doubt, but one who at the time seemed to only threaten the Mirrens. Elish Norn was also familiar with planeswalkers, having faced several in a failed assault on their citadel some time ago. And again, it appeared a planeswalker had come to challenge her supremacy. Ashiok lands in front of the regent, leaving enough space as to disengage from an attack. They looked over their masterpiece, one woven over a great deal of time after studying the Phyrexians and their unique minds. This nightmare was their art, and Elish Norn was a most unique canvas to work upon. The planeswalker explains that at first, they didn't believe Phyrexians would be suitable for their magic, but this test exceeded their expectations. It was indeed a test, and what better test subject than the greatest Phyrexian of all, the mother of machines herself. Still, the Phyrexian mind didn't process fear quite like a human's did. Fear? She was regent, she was not weak, she was not human, she was free of fear, or so she thought. But the fact remained, if she did not experience fear, then why had Ashiok come? What was fueling their magic? Though Elish Norn couldn't process it, she did feel fear from this nightmare. Elish Norn didn't take kindly to this amusement. It was nothing more than an illusion, a mere trifle, a trick. Using her connection to their people, Elish Norn willed in phantoms of her own to this dream world. Shadows took the form of Phyrexian agents, her agents, as Ashiok looked on in disbelief. This was their spell, their magic, their art. How could this Phyrexian implant her own nightmares within it? Ashiok's smirk left their face. Elish Norn sent out a command. We are one. This planeswalker had underestimated them. Jumping and floating through the sky, Ashiok managed to dodge the incoming spears and claws of the phantom Phyrexians. As Elish Norn herself threw out a wave of porcelain blades like a flash of light, the planeswalker just managing to fly up, leaving only traces of their robe in the dagger's path. Ashiok counters with a final spell, their last masterpiece. Shadows thick as molasses puddle at the feet of Elish Norn and take shape. It forms Elspeth Terrell, but wearing armor that mocked her own perfect shape. It was like a human version of herself, an image that filled the Praetor's gut with disgust. As Ashiok floated away, Elish Norn cut down the sad imitation of her with a single strike. Its face looked up at her with sympathy and pity, as if this 
Human scum felt bad for their superior. That face, its expression, was imprinted on Elish Norn's mind, and it sickened her. The words of the planeswalker echoed through the sky. You are quite the canvas indeed, mother of machines. The nightmare fades from reality. Her perfect world returned to her. No more plants or biological life corrupting her stone and metal palace. Only Elish Norn standing there, fully experiencing a new emotion that she had never felt before. This Elspeth, they filled her with fear and uncertainty, a true sin against the machine orthodoxy. There, Elish Norn swore to free the multiverse of this Elspeth Terrell, and hopefully free herself of this fear at the same time. No one still living had ever witnessed a plane fully completed. Kato Suzuki, a human ninja planeswalker from Kamigawa, did not expect to arrive on New Phyrexia and find pristine beaches. There was no sign that anything more dangerous than sunbathing had happened here. But he had to remember New Phyrexia would soon notice his presence, and quickly they would turn paradise to peril. Small, strong hands punched him in the face, making him open his eyes. Kato realized that what he'd taken for the sound of waves was metal clashing on metal, people grunting and screaming. His equipment was gone, including his sword and his kami spirit, Himoto, that often accompanied him in the form of a mechanical tanuki. The hand that had punched him belonged to the Wanderer, a planeswalker and Kato's childhood friend from Kamigawa, now grown into a formidable warrior herself. However, her spark was unstable, making it difficult to stay on one plane for very long. She started to phase from existence as she told Kato that they had hit a barrier of electrostatic wind that was somehow affecting all of them. It was hard for her to speak and concentrate on controlling her spark. Near him was Nahiri, a core lithomancer and planeswalker from Zendikar, animating the metallic grains of sand on the beach into a swirling attack aimed at strange Phyrexian creatures made of liquid metal. As the Wanderer tried to keep herself from fading into the blind eternities, she called Nahiri over to explain what happened to Kaido. Nahiri told him that the planar shield of New Phyrexia had scattered their team, leaving only Kaido, the Wanderer, and herself on the beach. The sand had affected them, lulling them into a false sense of security, but would kill them in time. Nahiri's lithomancy is the only thing that saved them, and though the liquid Phyrexian she fought was also lethal, her ability to control metal made the creature no real challenge. It had scratched her on the back of the neck, and her blood was still red. No oil. She had not been a sleeper agent. They need to get to the Furnace Lair, the domain of the Praetor Urabrask, where they had initially intended to land. It was the place where they had all agreed with Jace Balaran to meet the Mirren Resistance. The Wanderer focused all of her energy trying to stay on the plane as they walked through the gleaming landscape. Mirrodin's five suns still shone through the fog, giant orbs of mana, one of each color, that had once been hurled from the Lucani when the plane still had been Mirrodin. The Lucani were gravity warping tunnels that led through the layers of the plane down to its core. They approached a stone statue suspended by iron pillars and steel cables. It depicted a short and muscular elf, wearing unique clothes and holding weapons. Nahiri recognized it as a Zendikari Hedron, monolith she had made that could bind enemies of her plane in a prison, namely the Eldrazi Titans. It seems the Phyrexians and their world tree were already creeping onto other planes. They walked closer with caution as the cables suspending the statue writhed into motion, coiling as if ready to strike. The cables tracked Nahiri's motion and drew tighter around its captive, who opened his eyes and started to struggle. They leapt forward, attacking the cable to free the elf. Once the cables withered and dumped him on the ground, the stone drained from his body. He introduced himself as Tyvar Kell, a planeswalker from the plane of Kaldheim, an ally in their fight against New Phyrexia. They had to keep moving, though the Wanderer was flickering in and out of the plane. If she were to leave, they would have to wait for her to planeswalk back. Kaido couldn't leave her alone in this treacherous place. They made it to a sea of tents, inhabited by humans and Leonins. These truly organic beings were a welcoming sight. The Wanderer finally lost her grip on the plane and vanished. At least it happened in a safe place. A human woman with short red hair came out to meet them and introduced herself as Malira, a healer who was immune to Phyrexian oil. She led them through the encampment, 
telling them that this was the monumental facade, the outermost sphere of the plane dotted with temples and monuments celebrating the Phyrexians, hideous things blotting out the five suns for the layers below. Malira led them to a spot where a 10-foot square of ground dropped from under their feet. Nahiri had to take control of the square as they fell through the earth into the next layer. They descended into what the Phyrexians called Myrix, all that remained of Mirrodin before it became New Phyrexia. Malira led them through what remained, a dark wasteland, to the Mirren camp of Lowlight, where they could then get to the Furnace Lair. They used the gravity-defying tunnels to make their way to the next layer down. As they strode ahead, Malira noticed the bandage on the back of Nahiri's neck, and though she was a healer, she didn't ask how she got it. Not yet. Nahiri hung back to let Malira go ahead of her, so that she could check the bandage over the scratch on her neck. It was small, but it was very irritating. She peeled the bandage back to find no injury, just smooth skin, but it formed into a small protrusion. Nahiri pulled her hand away, seeing not blood, but black glistening oil on her fingertip. She was infected. She was already lost. She should tell her companions, but what good would it do? They couldn't kill her. She was too strong. She placed the bandage back over the wound, deciding she had to get away from her friends before she became the enemy. The Wanderer gained purchase on the plane of New Phyrexia once again. Around her, the Mirren camp was raised and gone. This had been the place that she left Kato just moments ago. She called for Kato, but no answer, just stillness and silence. She wished it didn't take all of her focus to stay on one place. All she could do was hope for their safety. If they were alive, she would see them again. For now, that had to be enough. It was all she had. As Luca looked around his surroundings, after having been blown off course as he planeswalked to New Phyrexia, he's surprised to find just how full of life this so-called corrupted plane was. When the planeswalker Jace Balaran first approached Luca, he was defensive, believing the Mind Mage had come because of his actions on Ikoria or at the School of Strixhaven. However, Jace came to offer him a position on a mission. A mission that would protect Ikoria from a terrible fate. Despite his mistakes, Luca cared for his world regardless how his people felt towards him. Jace believed his military experience would prove useful in this infiltration mission, and here he found himself, separated from his troops. Judging from his surroundings, Luca believed he landed in the Hunter Maze, a sphere loosely described by Jace before they traveled. His first order of business was to reconnect with his team. This wasn't going to be a successful solo mission. Luca thinks to himself, if he can find a creature of this world, he could perhaps dominate it, use its knowledge of this place to find a way out. He climbed up a mechanical tree for a better vantage. As he reaches the top, he hears cries of battle and beasts, winged Phyrexians swooping down on prey desperately fighting for survival. The prey? A willowy elf and a pale woman whose swordplay flowed like water. He had met them before. This was Nyssa and the one known as the Wanderer, allies. They were holding their own, the Wanderer's graceful strikes removing limbs with ease as Nyssa sprouted shining metallic leaves from the surrounding foliage, using their razor edges in a swirling gale of death to the Phyrexians gathered around them. Still, they were in danger from a foe unseen. Luca unsheaths his harpoon. He sees a hawking Phyrexian centaur skulking the trees, watching the battle, waiting for the opportune moment to strike from the canopy. The Wanderer below flickered from existence odd timing to planeswalk, Luca thought, as he turns his attention to the beast, another creature for him to dominate. His magic reached out to the Phyrexian's mind, grabbing onto the little remaining biological parts left within its skull. It was enough for Luca to find purchase and squeeze the Phyrexian's will until it was broken. Luca had dominated a Phyrexian, bonded with it. Nissa had ended the rest of the enemies, as Luca jumped down riding atop his captured monster. Nissa was at first happy to see an ally, but upon recognizing the militaristic Luca, her expression changed. She didn't know much about the man, but what she did, she didn't like. Still, it was a semi-friendly face. Luca's plan was to use the knowledge of this bond to find the surface of this lair, get the lay of the land, then find his way to Elish Norn's domain to meet up with the others. Nyssa begrudgingly agrees, but makes it known that bonding with a Phyrexian is a terrible idea. There's no saying who controls who in this type of relationship. Luca simply believes his will is stronger. He is stronger and can handle it, but reassures Nyssa that if he feels even so much as a stomach ache, 
he'll end the Phyrexian. The Hunter Maze lived up to its name. Its winding tree lines made it nearly impossible to get your bearings. Luca had once been a tactical star on Ikoria, leading the Coppercoats against monsters twice as imposing as his new Phyrexian partner. But here he felt lost. The years of feeling like an outcast, a failure, he felt so much stronger than others perceived him to be. But not now. He hadn't always been as tall, as strong as he was now. Once before he'd hit his growth in adolescence, a group of older boys had cornered him. Already he'd known he was different, though he hadn't understood how. On some level, the other boys had sensed it too, an invisible barrier that prevented him from being one of them. They cornered him, five to one. He decided to retreat, but they tripped him. He had to choose while curled up against the blows raining down, his head or his ribs. He'd wrapped his arms over his skull, and he endured. He'd show them later, of course, they'd regret it. The trees hid many Phyrexian creatures. They seemed to murmur to him, imagine the power, they would say over and over. But just then, a flash of light, a woman screaming, watch out, as a leathery Phyrexian swoops down to remove their heads. It grabs at Nyssa and pins her arm down, preventing her magic or even from her drawing her sword. As they fell over, Luca's mind melds with the Phyrexian partner, asking for it to secure him, which it does in a very invasive way. Viney wires sprung from the beast and plunged into Luca's chest. There was no pain, only the feeling of security and power. Luca's body and his Phyrexian became one, as it braces the Planeswalker's fall and lifts him up in a defensive stance, pulling his harpoon out and slinging it at the attacking enemies, killing it with a decisive strike. Smaller, scavenging Phyrexians jump on the corpse, whispering words only Luca hears. Only the fittest deserve to survive. They were right, he thought. Luca was still there mentally, still on mission, and with no other option besides planes walk away and give up, Nyssa continues on. The words grow stronger, louder. You deserve power. You are strong. Here, strength is rewarded. The weak are called. They wander into a metallic paradise full of oozing berries pulsing with black oil. A cave lined by fleshy intestinal walls seemed to beckon them in. Luca hadn't realized how beautiful this place was until now. Their own surroundings seem to fight against them, as the cave releases a swarm of grub-like Phyrexians that clawed and bit at the planeswalkers like leeches. A simple scratch could cost them their lives. Then, a bright light. The Wanderer had reappeared to jump into action despite seeming a bit confused. Her blade worked in tandem with Nyssa's magic and the brute strength of Luca's bonded monster. The cave walls began to shudder around them. This was no cave, but another Phyrexian horror looking to consume its prey. They all leapt out just in time, thanks in part to the speed of Luca's new body. While the three planeswalkers made it out, Luca's bonded centaur Phyrexian was caught in the maw. Its pain became Luca's pain. How wrong he was thinking initially it was a mindless, mechanical, and emotionless creature. With superhuman strength and speed, Luca leapt to free his companion. These changes don't seem so bad to me, Nyssa. They're useful more than anything else, he thinks to himself. His fingers become sharp, cutting like steel, as his monster frees itself and rejoins its master. They continue on. Luca says they're almost near the maze's center. Nyssa corrects him. They're trying to get out, right? Luca remembered, yes. They wanted to escape and not move inward. When did his mission change in his mind, he wondered. They turn to the Wanderer, asking if she's seen the others in her sporadic travels. What should they do? She says she only spotted Vorinclax, the green predator who skulks this realm. She knows where he is. Nyssa and Luca both agree that attacking Vorinclax is off mission. They need to regroup with the others. But the Wanderer convinces them that this is a unique opportunity to remove a powerful ally of Elish Norns from the board. They shouldn't squander it. Nyssa and Luca find their own reasons to agree, and so the mission changes. Now they turn to kill Vorinclax, who sits at the maze's center. As Luca's companion leads them inwards, they hear the sounds of a fight. They look out to see the giant beast Vorinclax fighting one-on-one -on -one against a completed elf. Nyssa recognizes the figure from Jace's briefings. It was Glissa, a powerful Phyrexian commander who was first completed by Vorinclax. The Praetor met the elf's attack blow for blow, pairing with his stiffened appendages and countering as Glissa stumbled back. Luca saw this as a dance, a struggle for power. It made sense to him now. 
the Wanderer again wanders, leaving just Nyssa and Luca. The three may have been able to take Glissa and Vorinclex, but now it seemed hopeless. They should abandon this mission and continue to the others. Nyssa may feel this way, but Luca is surging with strength, along with the desire to prove that strength. They can take them. Besides, has she already forgotten his Phyrexian abomination? It was still technically three on two. Luca threw himself at Glissa while Nyssa took on Vorinclex. Glissa spun with a hiss and threw up her clawed hands in defense. Luca didn't need a weapon to attack her. He too had his own claws. He exchanged blows with Glissa and she grinned. They were perfectly matched. He hadn't felt like this in years, not since his last great sparring match with the Coppercoats. Glissa seemed to feel the same and he could hear himself laughing, laughing with pure happiness. But then Luca stumbled. He called out for his companion who answered perfectly. It protected Luca without question, offering him power beyond his understanding. They fused even more. Its spine became his spine. Its lungs breathed for Luca. Its strength was added to his own. He was now fully combined with his Phyrexian. With a final snap, their minds merged. Luca now saw the beauty of this sphere and how Vorinclex dominated everything. His strength was the only law a law Luca now respected. The Praetor turned towards his new thrall, commanding Luca to attack Nyssa. Only the strong survive, and Luca was now strong. Nyssa is shocked and horrified at the sight, a newly Phyrexianized Luca. Finally she feared him, finally she respected him. This was how it's meant to be, the voices grow louder. This is how it's supposed to be, the strong triumphing over the weak. This is what it means to live. There are those who take it, then there are those who deal it. Nyssa guarded with her sword. Luca didn't need a weapon, he was the weapon. The Wanderer flickered back in, watching a struggling Nyssa retreating from the Phyrexian Planeswalker. She only held her place on New Phyrexia for a moment, yelling at Nyssa to run before planeswalking away. Nyssa broke away from the fight and dashed for safety. Glissa reached out to her new ally, commanding Luca to hunt Nyssa and bring her back to Vorinclex alive. She would be useful in the war to come on New Phyrexia. Beside him, he heard Vorinclex's low, growling laughter. He felt the vicarious pleasure that Glissa took in his confidence, and he felt himself smile. The hunter maze was expansive, and beautiful, and terrible, and it was time to go hunting. Elspeth Terrell, like the other planeswalkers of the strike team, encountered rough travels while planeswalking to New Phyrexia. The impact of this magical barrier left her battered and unconscious on the surface of this corrupted world. When she awakes, a feeling of dread overtakes her. She knew fear would be an obstacle, but being here again was almost too much for her. Her allies were nowhere to be seen. Maybe they had been captured, already lost to Phyrexia. Elspeth didn't have much time to mourn that possibility, as she spots a group of half-metal monstrosities approaching her. With Luxior in hand, the skilled warrior cut down three of the six ferocious beasts, but was finally starting to lose ground. Fear gripped her. A purple incorporeal blade cuts through another Phyrexian, Kaya, an ally. The rest of the enemies are dispatched easily. Kaya says that someone else's gear had somehow traveled with her, including ornate blades and a strange animatronic tanuki. Elspeth knew this device wasn't Mirin or Phyrexian. She guessed Kamigawin. Elspeth believed Kaya didn't fully grasp the danger of fighting Phyrexians. Even a small exposure could mean death, and exposure was all around them. Still, Kaya's levity and positivity was refreshing to Elspeth's pessimistic thoughts. Together they moved towards the Mirren camp, following Jace Beleren's plan using Elspeth's familiarity with the landscape to their advantage. They made their way to a Mirren dig site, where the troll, Thrun, had discovered a way to peel through the multiple spheres that made up the plain of New Phyrexia. Each sphere was like another world onto itself, and climbing down one was like climbing up through another. The pair used these gravity-defying tunnels to venture into the quiet furnace, the fiery hell of New Phyrexia, and the final bastion of the Mirren Resistance. Floating between spheres, they spot tents. A good sign, Phyrexians don't set up camps. It was the Mirren Resistance, and possibly their lost allies, assuming they were still alive. They're greeted by beings coated in metal, but still full of life, a rebellious lot. 
the native Mirans. A deep voice calls out to Elspeth. To her gleeful surprise, it's Koth, her former ally and a dear friend. Together they had once fought for a free Mirrodin, only to fail. She presumed he had died in their failure, but was happy to find him just as resilient as ever. As they embraced with their reunion, Kaya too spotted a familiar face, or rather, a familiar bare chest. It was Tyvar Kel. They quickly regrouped to discuss the status of their plan, whom among them were still fighting. Jace then appeared behind them. He had made it to the camp alone, having been separated when they originally planes walked. The Mind Mage explained that the barrier they passed had severed their mind link, making communication across the plane impossible. He also explained that Vraska and Luca weren't with them when they woke up. The Wanderer seemed to have planes walked away because of her unstable spark, while Jace says that Nissa too planes walked away, but it seemed forced. Nahiri and Kaido were in the camp with them and appeared to join the others. Kaya reunited Kaido with his gear, including the kami filled mech who chittered as if he had returned home scurrying up to Kaido's shoulders. Jace takes charge, putting the group back on track. They had no time to daddle. Regardless of their numbers, they needed to attack now. The plan hadn't changed. Make it to the seed core sphere of New Phyrexia, find their corrupted world tree called Realmbreaker, set off the Silex at its roots, and end the Phyrexian threat to the multiverse. They had all the pieces in place. Victory was still possible. But what exactly would that victory cost? The Mirren human, Malira, Koth's dear friend and a being who can heal those infected with glistening oil, steps forward to hear more of their plan. Plainly, she asks Jace if this bomb, the Silex, would destroy all of their plane in an attempt to eradicate the Phyrexians. Though protecting the multiverse from the Phyrexians was deeply important, protecting her world was important as well. She fought to restore Mirrodin. She wouldn't willingly sacrifice it. Jace had calculated the blast radius. It shouldn't do much more than destroy the sphere of Realmbreaker, but he does admit he didn't fully understand the makeup of New Phyrexia. Malira educates her new allies on the structure of her home, its spheres. She uses Nahiri's lithomancy to create a display as a visual aid. At the center is the seed core, their target, Realmbreaker. Tyvar was visually uncomfortable at the thought of a corrupted version of Kaldheim's world tree. Above that are the Mycosynth Gardens, the original fungus fields used to spread the Phyrexian corruption across Mirrodin. Above that, the Fair Basilica, the throne of Elish Norn. This is where Urobrask and his rebellious Phyrexians would attack to provide a distraction. Above that is the Dross Pits, the domain of Shieldred. Next up is the Surgical Bay, the laboratories of Jingitaxius. And further up, the Hunter Maze, the realm of Vornklax. Next was the Quiet Furnace, the molten hell they currently resided. And still, there was another sphere above them, formerly called Myrix, the last remnants of old Mirrodin, which was now slowly being taken over by the Phyrexians. With this lesson, Jace recalculates. Not knowing how hollow these spheres were, or how much the Phyrexians had altered them, the Silex could very well tear the entire plane apart. Malira thanks Jace for his honesty. While she doesn't relish the thought of losing Mirrodin and all her loved ones, in truth, they had been fighting over ashes and graves for years. This was their final chance, a slim hope of a Mirrodin victory. They would press forward. Malira and Koth introduced the group to a new weapon they've been using in this war, a metal they call Hexgold. It was created from the old glimmer void of old Mirrodin, treating the plates with Blink Moth Serum. It was very rare, but proved powerful against the Phyrexians. Blades made of hex gold seemed to cut easily through those infected, while its dust also seemed to slow or even prevent the spread of glistening oil, although this still was majorly just a theory. Tyvar used his unique magic to incorporate the hex gold into his own armor and weapons, while Kaido had some of the hex gold dust added to his Tanuki drone friend. Koth and Elspeth ventured together just outside the camp for a more private discussion. They expressed how they felt after their failed fight on Mirrodin years ago. Elspeth believed Koth had died, while Koth was always relieved that he was at least able to save her life. Koth tells Elspeth that he looks forward to fighting with her again, and maybe this time, dying alongside her as well. Elspeth is surprised Koth is joining them, but of course welcomes it, as she now feels their chances with him are much better. The friends embrace. 
Nahiri was also preparing to depart with the others, readying herself for what would surely be a challenging fight. She checks the wound she suffered when she first arrived. A blunt spike had grown under the bandage. She was infected, there was no doubt. But should she tell the others? They indeed needed her help. They were already down too many. What would they do? Kill her? Malira appeared behind Nahiri, noticing the spike. Malira had seen countless infected. She could practically smell the disease. She knew the Lithomancer had been corrupted. She could heal Nahiri. She was still very early on, and it was very likely to be cured. However, the treatment would take them both out of commission for days. Days their mission couldn't wait. Nahiri herself was needed as well. Malira tosses her a pouch of hex gold powder, instructing her to place it on the wound. Doing so covered it in a flesh-like bandage which Nahiri again covered in cloth. She even felt slightly better. It was a stopgap, but it bought them time. She could possibly be fully healed after their mission, but they shouldn't dally. Nahiri felt invigorated. Already being infected freed her to fight without regard for her health. New Phyrexia would see the full force of a daughter of Zendikar. Together the group gathered into carts, along with the Mirren Resistance and a demolition crew led by Koth. They would travel through the spheres and set off the Silex. They had to win. They had to. Other carts were ahead of Elspeth's, gathering gear and disembarking. Koth's demolition team was scouting a safe path through the toxic pools to the Fair Basilica, where Elish Norn controlled New Phyrexia. They were joined by Nahiri, Jace, and Kaya, the last of which had faced her lower legs into translucency to avoid the Necrogen. A smart tactic, if only everyone else was so lucky. They would use the chaos of the Dross Pits to sneak past the Seven Steel Thanes. Powerful Phyrexians in their own right fought for universal power over the sphere, rarely ever uniting. The black-aligned Praetor, Shiodred, had come out on top, but no one ever expected her rule to last that long. Shiodred had in fact aligned with the red Praetor, Urobrask, against Elish Norn, along with other thanes, such as Roxith, the Thane of Rot, Geth, the Lord of the Vault, and Vran, Thane of Blood. Geth, who went under a new title, Lord of Contracts, had unfortunately already been killed by Elish Norn's minions, the voice of the Praetors, Atroxa, and her daughter, Ixhale. The remaining three not making up this warband against Elish Norn were likely to be distracted in their efforts to grab territory and power, expecting the other thanes to betray them, so they wouldn't pose much of a threat to this mission. Kaido arrived in a cart with Tyvar, one wishing to sneak through the sphere overlooked, and the other unable to fathom the desire to ever be overlooked. Elspeth passed around bottles of Halo that would protect them from the Necrogen fumes, at least for a little while. After swallowing the Halo, Jace dropped the bottle, gasping for breath. He began to twitch. His pulse was going haywire. Halo couldn't hurt people, and this wasn't Phoresis, but Jace was clearly in pain. Jace leapt from his cart, attempting to take off across the deadly landscape. Tyvar caught him by the arm as he began to murmur. The halo actually cleared his head, and now he heard Vraska calling for help. Vraska, the Gorgon Planeswalker assassin and the guildmaster of the Golgari Swarm on the plain of Ravnica. She was everything to Jace. He wanted to go to her, he needed to go to her, and promised telepathically that they would meet up with the rest of the Resistance later. It was rash. Jace had the Silex. And as he ran off, the rest of the planeswalkers abandoned their plans and ran after him. They saw warring figures, blackened metal shells of the Dross Pit inhabitants, fighting against Urabrask's molten minions. Luckily, the Red Align Praetor was firmly on their side. As they ran past undetected, Elspeth realized that Jace was protecting them, using a spell to make them invisible to the battling Phyrexians. Looming ahead was the decay of Shieldred's Colosseum, where Phyrexians, or those deemed unworthy of perfection, were forced to fight. It was a monument to their tyranny. As they ran through the Colosseum gates, Kaido suggested to Elspeth that they should take the Silex and leave Jace to his rescue mission. Elspeth, however, wouldn't do it. What was the point of fighting if they couldn't even make an effort to save one of their own? Inside the Colosseum was a vast black floor with a giant bubbling dross pit in the middle, surrounded by rows of chairs so steep that spectators could easily tumble from it if they weren't careful. 
Standing in the middle was Vraska, afflicted with hundreds of bleeding wounds surrounded by Phyrexians. The rest of the area was littered with dead Mirans and petrified Phyrexian bodies. Clearly, Vraska fought hard, using her glaring vision to defeat many opponents. They all drew their weapons and shouted, for Mirrodin, charging in to save Vraska. Jace was still veiled by his magic, but the Phyrexians turned to fight the other planeswalkers. Tyvar rushed in to help Kaido block an attacking Phyrexian, whose sword crunched into the elf's metal-plated back. Kaido used telekinesis to peel the glistening oil left on Tyvar's skin and throw a ball of the oil at the Phyrexian's eyes, blinding it just long enough for Tyvar to land a fatal blow. Koth had fought in this Colosseum before, alone, but now he was with friends. He and Elspeth attacked a crustacean-like Phyrexian, cutting off a claw and flinging it at the line of enemies that advanced. Nahiri was a true dealer of destruction, a cloud of molten, whirling knives. The Phyrexians were hardly a match for her. Jace reached Vraska, but she raised a hand to ward him off. Jace told her that Elspeth was here with Halo, a magical substance from her home world that could possibly protect them. And so was Malira, who could even outright cure Phoresis. It wasn't nearly as bad as she thought. Vraska declines. She didn't mean to call Jace to her, but they were mentally linked, and in her pain, she let her emotions make that terrible decision. Jace willed that Vraska understood that she was saved. Vraska told him she wasn't saved at all. The poison was already inside her, and she could no longer fight it off. It was too late. Nahiri and her cloud of knives moved forward, dispassionately offering to end Vraska when she was still mentally herself. Better to die as a planeswalker than to be killed as a Phyrexian. Jace spat a threat at Nahiri. They had to at least try to save her. Vraska told them to run. She told Jace that she loved him, and not to let their love be the thing that destroys him. She wanted them to save the multiverse and live. That would make her happy. Jace wouldn't leave her, but the others would. He couldn't believe they were giving up on her. He couldn't let Vraska die, at least die alone. Jace and Vraska were lost in their own world, not noticing the other planeswalkers leaving. The others ran out of the Colosseum, emerging in the middle of a war. Without Jace, there was nothing concealing them from the ranks of Phyrexians outside the Colosseum walls. They were exhausted from their fight to get to Vraska, but they couldn't press forward without clearing the field. Elspeth reached for Koth's hand and squeezed his fingers. They had done everything they could. They might fail right here, but they had indeed tried. For Mirrodin? She asked. Koth echoed her with a roar, and the planeswalkers surged forward. Jace took Vraska's hand and asked her to close her eyes. When she opened them, the Colosseum was gone. They were on the streets of Ravnica, the plane where they met, dressed for an afternoon stroll. If Jace couldn't save her from Phyrexia, he would spend one more day with her. She could almost believe his wonderful illusion as they wandered the streets of the city. This was his dream of their future together, had the multiverse and fate only been a little kinder. Vraska thanked Jace but told him it was time to go before she was totally completed and tried to attack. Jace always needed to be the hero who finds the answer, but sometimes there just isn't one. They moved close, sharing one last kiss in the shadow of the end. In that moment, Vraska stabbed Jace in the palm and his illusion shattered around them. Vraska smiled, holding him as he tried to pull away. For the glory of Phyrexia, she hissed. Vraska had stabbed Jace with a long, curving scorpion tail, delivering a dose of glistening oil. She unleashed her gaze, her true gaze, upon him for the first time, Jace covering his face with his burning arm, running away. Vraska's laugh haunted him as he ran through the gates, meeting the other planeswalkers in battle. Nahiri was fighting fiercely, her bandage ripped free, exposing a bony protrusion from the back of her neck, her own corruption thanks to Phyrexia. Her magic rose like a burning tide, seemingly inexhaustible, relentless, as she dropped her floating knives. Instead, her sword glowed brighter, and the Colosseum began to warp and crack. The bony growth on her neck began to spread, revealing veins of deep, burning red where blood should have been. Her eyes turned black as she told Jace to finish the job. Her sacrifice here can't be for nothing. 
In that moment, she was a figure of legend. In that moment, she cleaved New Phyrexia. There was a vast, terrible shattering, and everything fell into darkness. Dust clogged the air, and Elspeth pushed a large piece of debris off her torso and began to look for the others. The impact had smashed her pack, shattering their remaining bottles of Halo. Koth pushed himself up from the rubble and looked up into the sky. There was a vast hole, dark against the silver atmosphere, like someone had smashed their way through. Nahiri had dropped the entire Colosseum into the Fair Basilica. The others were picking their way out of the rubble. They had survived along with the Silex. Phyrexians began to pour from the hole, not falling, but clinging to the silver surface of the sky. The Phyrexians of the Fair Basilica, caked in red sinew and white porcelain, climbed up the hollow metallic walls to meet Urabrask's forces. Then, bright against the horizon, flew the Phyrexian angel Atroxa. Jace showed his friends the wound Vraska had given him, but Malira couldn't heal him here where it was so dangerous. That process could take several days, and they were far too vulnerable to do it now. The halo in his system would slow the oil, but it wouldn't stop it. They had to make their way toward Elish Norn's altar so that they could accomplish their mission. The loss of Vraska and his own future seemed to have broken Jace, and Elspeth couldn't stand to look at him like that for very long. They were trapped here in the heart of New Phyrexia. They had lost three in total if you counted Jace, along with the Halo. How much did they have left to lose? Koth told the group they had to keep moving to honor Nahiri's sacrifice. She had been infected. Elspeth thought there was no way she didn't know, but she never said anything to the group. Malira spoke up admitting that Nahiri had told her when they were back in the furnace lair. Malira could have healed her, but she would have been incapacitated for days. Phoresis reached through the body like a hundred roots, and when you dig one out, you'd find a hundred more. Its treatment was an arduous process. They would have had to stay behind while Nahiri's body repaired itself. She saw that as wasting time they didn't have. Kaya asks Malira if she can heal Jace. Jace walked along behind them, still carrying the Silex close. But now, wire and metal shone through the wound on his arm. The flesh that remained was raw and wet, blackening as it transmuted into fibrous cables. Malira was willing to heal him, but she was unsure if Jace would let her. Using telepathy, Jace told her that he would not risk them all to save his own life, not when he had already lost Raska. His mental voice fell silent. He had to spend all of his energy on moving forward. Tyvar, in an attempt to brighten their spirits, told them that they must honor Nahiri's story and the end she wrote for it by walking away victorious. Kaido, on the other hand, just hoped that Nahiri was actually dead. She was probably more powerful than all of them. He doubted that even two of them together could take her on. They hadn't found a body in the debris. Though Nahiri sacrificed herself for them, she might still return as an inexhaustible enemy. This wasn't a place for pretty illusions or what-ifs. It would just get them hurt here in New Phyrexia. They must focus on the here and now and keep moving forward. Suddenly, Kaya drew their attention to a still colossus, red and white, to blend in with the landscape. Neither insectile, reptilian, nor humanoid. Koth informed them that Elish Norn didn't like to give up what belonged to her. These were the warriors that served her best, ossified into monuments. He had seen some of these become animated to kill Mirans before, so they had to be cautious. They couldn't pick a safe route. There wasn't one. They had to cross this bridge to get to Elish Norn's altar, which would lead them down to the Mycosynth Gardens. There, they would have access to the Seed Core, where Realmbreaker was planted. Realmbreaker was sprouted from the stolen seed of the World Tree on the plain of Kaldheim, the home of Tyvar the Elf. He explained that the World Tree grows within the cosmos itself, linking all the realms, existing inside and outside of reality. He didn't understand how it didn't split the plane in two when it sprouted. It was both a miracle and a horror. Realmbreaker was planted below the seed core, where Elish Norn imprisoned Karn. Its roots run deep, and the branches reached through the Mycosynth Gardens. Malira told them that on these branches, omen paths had been created, portals between realms, portals they had to close as soon as possible. They passed under the empty gaze of the Goliath Phyrexian Monument, Jace solemnly bringing up the rear. 
the doors of the altar gaped open, like the terrible maw of an all-consuming beast, frozen somewhere between life and death. They walked into the empty foyer, alert, embraced for trouble. Frozen and Phyrexians studded the walls, Elish Norn's loyal subjects. They were, in all likelihood, walking into a trap. First, they were scattered along the surface as they arrived. Then, they found Raska left barely alive to call for Jace. It all must have been planned. New Phyrexia had a Johnny Goldmane on their side, and Elish Norn was smart enough to use him against his friends. Still, Elish Norn was not all-knowing, and her forces were distracted by the Rebellion. The combined forces of Mirans as well as Urabrasks and Shieldred's Phyrexians were proving a suitable distraction. They pressed deeper into the building, passing more motionless bodies of Phyrexian nightmares. Elish Norn's throne was unguarded. Beneath it was a chamber with winding stairs leading down to the Mycosynth Gardens. Once they reached the end of the stairs, they saw the white of the fair basilica give way to a steely bluish gray pebble texture. Malira warned them not to touch it. It was the Mycosynth that took Mirrodin in the first place, sending their infectious spores throughout the plane. Behind them, Jace groaned, his stomach splitting as writhing metallic cords fought for dominion over the tissue of his body. They needed to go deeper to the seed core. Malira led them through the metal laced landscape, avoiding the mycosynth. They approached the gateway, which was just a pile of twisted fungal strands. Malira tells them that it infects anything it touches. It was a good thing that she was immune to phoresis, but the others couldn't boast such fortunes. As she moved close, the pile pulsed before opening into a hole of darkness ringed with waving tendrils. The tendrils reached out to caress Malira, leaving some glistening oil that she was able to just wipe away. The rest of them didn't have her resistance. There had to be another way in. Tyvar remembered how Kaido peeled the glistening oil off his skin before it made its way inside of his body while they were fighting in the Colosseum. If he could do that again, Tyvar might be able to spread his transmutation magic across all of the group once they got into the Seed Core. This would give them all the same hex gold armor that hugged his skin. It offered at least some resistance. He wouldn't be able to hold the spell for long, and the glistening oil resisted Kaido's telekinesis, but they had to try. None of them would be able to use their magic while Tyvar's own was affecting them, so they had to use the remaining halo to stave off the oil until Kaido could use his magic again. Tyvar transmuted his skin into Glimmer Void Metal, then it spread, covering the rest of them. Glimmer Void Metal was native to Mirrodin, and could resist Phoresis. The group walked past the tendrils, which left streaks of oil behind on their hardened skin. They filed through a narrow hall and onto an open bridge, taking in the horrific landscape, more disturbing than other visions of New Phyrexia because it was alive and growing. Tyvar released his spell, and their skin, flesh once more, glistened with black oil. Kaido was able to lift the oil off of them, balling it up and lobbing it to the side of the bridge. They turned to behold the Phyrexian world tree, Realm Breaker. Elish Norn had cultivated, nurtured, and corrupted it. Its bark was the same white porcelain metal of the Fair Basilica, vivid red showing through the fissures that had opened up on its surface. It bled glistening oil instead of sap. The branches reached up towards the blind eternities. On the branches hung invasion ships, almost ready to infect the multiverse. In the highest branches of the tree, light poured out spreading into a hauntingly symmetrical lattice. They ran across the narrow bridge that connected the gardens to the core, making for a dark opening in the tangled roots of the tree. They were almost there when the sky flashed. Explosions filled the air with rainbow distortions. And then, the bright impossibility of the blind eternities. They were too late. It was all for nothing. Realm Breaker had connected to the multiverse. Elish Norn has access to every plane. They could still do their best to try and undo this. We have to hurry, Jace said breathless as he collapsed. Tyvar transmuted his skin into Glimmer Void Metal again and scooped Jace into his arms, making sure Jace's old infection doesn't spread to him. They continued into the dark opening of Realm Breaker's roots. Inside the cavity of the tree, the walls were woven roots. There were passages split off from the chamber, with a large one seeming to be the main channel. At the center on the low dais was Karn. The silver golem had been vivisected and spread across the platform. Karn turned his unattached head and croaked, telling them that they shouldn't have come. New Phyrexia had rejected their former father of machines. Elspeth told Karn that they had made a replica of the Silex. They might still be able to save some of the planes out there. 
Karn would take the burden from them if he could, but he couldn't even move. Jace showed Karn his injury. It was too late for both of them. He hobbled to the doorway on the other side of the room, followed by Tyvar and Kaya. Malira attempted to shift Karn's head to make him more comfortable, wiping away glistening oil. Koth and his explosives team began setting charges to free Karn from his restraints. Elspeth asked if Karn wanted her to stay. Out of selfishness, he did, but urged her to follow Jace. Koth and his team would stay to help Karn once he was free. Elspeth promised she would see him again, and turned to walk through the doorway. The final bridge was long, white, and riddled with red. On the other side, there was a replica of Norn's altar, but made from twisted roots of the Realm Breaker. Jace was back on his own feet, listening to the chorus of voices that hummed through the air. Phyrexians could harmonize, he just realized. Intrigued him. They were able to look up the inside of the trunk, seeing flashes of other planes through the haze. Near the upper branches, they could see the Phyrexians shuffling along the gangways of the invasion vessels. Millions of the white vessels spewed red, contagious smoke. They'd been here, preparing for the real fight, all along. They heard steady and confident footsteps behind them on the bridge. Jace backed away with the Silex as the rest of the group turned ready, unsheathing their weapons. It was Ajani and Tybalt, but not as they had known them. Ajani wore red and white armor that seemingly grew from his body, marking him as one of Elish Norns. He carried a double-headed axe, blades reserved for her honor. He welcomed them in his familiar voice, expressing his happiness that Elspeth made it here to join him. Elspeth drew her sword, Luxior. She wasn't here to join him, she was here to stop him. Ajani asks why, with honest curiosity. They would be together forever, harmonious. No more conflict, no more pain, all will be won. Beside him, Tybalt was a nightmare of bony plates and protrusions connected by raw, braided sinew, recognizable only through the smirk on the remaining fleshy parts of his face. His tail had split at the base, ending in two wicked stingers that dripped glistening oil. The half-devil planeswalker was first infected back on Kaldheim by Vorinclax. Apparently the seed the Praetor promised to remove was left to fester, until this demented sadist now inflicted pain for Elish Norn. Tybalt always knew Tyvar would see the end by his hand. Tyvar told Kaido to take the others and run. He and Elspeth were predestined to win this fight against Ajani and Tybalt. Tyvar watched Kaido and Kaya help Jace through the doorway into the back of the room. Then they turned to engage their enemy. Ajani roared as Elspeth leapt toward him, and Tybalt lunged for Tyvar as Glimmer Void Metal rippled across his skin. The screaming followed soon after. Kaya thought it a bad sign that Jace let them see how far gone he was, rather than casting a soothing illusion over himself. Himoto, a spirit appearing as a tanuki drone, was cooing at Kaido's side, rubbing his cheek and trying to soothe him. Kaya thought about cracking a joke about needing a teddy bear, but honestly, she wished she had brought a friend with her as well. Though he was a stranger to her, Kaido shared in his hatred of this place. On his home plane of Kamigawa existed Ozaiju, the great tree that lived in harmony with everything around it. It was filled with spirits called Kami, but in this place, the spirits must have been consumed along with everything else, or they would be screaming without end. The Kami were not like the spirits Kaya was used to dealing with. The Kami were born immortal. Kaya was used to spirits that were born from death, but with as much death as this plane had seen, there were no spirits. There was nothing. Phyrexia didn't release its victims, not even in death. The halls around them were empty, which felt less like luck and more like a trap. Jace hadn't turned quite yet, and he still had the Silex. Still, their hope seemed more helpless after leaving Elspeth behind. Something about her made it easy to believe the impossible. Elspeth was left to duel with her lost friend Ajani, who had been completed and enthralled by Elish Norn. The ceiling gave way to clear panels mimicking a fly's wings, but split with dark veins pulsing with glistening oil. Through the panels, they could see bridges filled with endless ranks of Phyrexian warriors in the red and white of Elish Norn's factions, marching to the waiting invasion ships. Kaido spotted a hole in the floor that looked like it was meant to be an entrance to a stairway, except whoever had made it forgot to build the actual stairs. Roughly a 10-foot drop led to a hovering disk of white metal with no walls surrounding it. There was another hole in the disk below, exposing Realmbreaker's trunk until it vanished into mist. 
This was as close to the core root of the tree as they were going to come. Kaya phased herself intangible and dropped onto the disc below. Now smelling ozone, mycosynth, and a perversion of Coldheim's sweet air, Jace teetered on the edge of the hole and finally jumped to be caught by Kaya, who desperately tried to avoid the writhing cords coming from his body. Jace unpacked the Silex, revealing it to the Phyrexian air for the first time as Kaido jumped down nimbly. Kaido asked if it was safe for them to be this close. Kaya explained that Urza detonated the original Silex in his lap and he survived. They'd be fine. Probably. Assuming the plane survived and the shockwave traveling up the tree didn't rip New Phyrexia apart from core to crust, it could still send the last of the Mirans into oblivion. If Nahiri had survived her fall and not yet turned, she would be blotted out in an instant of the blast. So would they. Kaya felt uneasy as Jace moved into a cross-legged position with the Silex in his lap. The invasion tree had connected. The Silex could damage or destroy every plane in contact with Realmbreaker. They had no way of knowing which planes they were, but they would be casualties. The Silex obliterates everything it touches. Even time was fractured when Urza set the original off. If the blast could travel through the omen paths of the tree, it could destroy everything. They could even blow up the blind eternities. Jace was dying, and he didn't blame Kaya and Kaido if they killed him before he could turn his powers against them. He had spent so much time and effort trying not to destroy the minds of others just because he could, or moving in a multiverse so simply without causing endless damage. He would become an incredible weapon for New Phyrexia. Now they were starting to speak through him, and his eyes flashed an inhuman blue, brighter than usual. Jace tries to compose himself. They weren't going to destroy anything with the Silex. They would only be preventing greater deaths. There was no other way than to bring the ending, to renew it all. Jace was willing to sacrifice countless planes, possibly even the entire multiverse, in order to stop the Phyrexians. Kaya knew what was rattling through Jace's slipping mind. Phyrexia had to be stopped, but not at the cost of the multiverse itself. Kaya lunged forward, grabbing Jace's wrist before he could pick the Silex up again. She pulled a dagger from her belt as Jace's eyes began to glow. Kaido was confused for a moment, and then realized that he should draw his sword also. On the bridge over the void, Ajani's axe clashed against Elspeth's sword, pushing her back even as she dug her heels into the sinewy surface and tried to stand her ground. Ajani willed her to join him, to be ideal, to be one. If he had sounded any less like himself, Elspeth might have been able to undercut his ankles and send him toppling into the depths. Instead, his voice was calm, carrying only genuine affection and concern. Ajani tried to convince her that Phyrexia was no one's enemy, that they only wanted to bring peace and perfection. Elspeth retorted that New Phyrexia was everyone's enemy. Ajani resolved to say that she didn't have to be alive to join them, finally attacking without holding back. He narrowly missed Elspeth's head, swinging his axe with a blast of destructive magical force. Not far from Elspeth and Ajani, Tyvar used his blades to keep the twin barbs of Tybalt's tail at bay. Tyvar's skin was still metallic and gleaming, his entire body having converted into glimmer void metal for the protection it could offer him against the glistening oil that dripped from Tybalt's body. Tybalt taunted Tyvar, telling him there would be no heroic sagas in his name, only tales of failure. Tybalt whipped his tails as Tyvar blocked them with his glimmer void arms. Tyvar hissed in pain. Tybalt hissed in pleasure. The two united for the first and perhaps only time in their acquaintance. Tyvar was resistant to Tybalt's magic, a cloud of doubt that infected all around him, because Tyvar was too confident to understand why he should doubt his convictions. Tybalt told him most were not so devoid of concerns, turning towards Elspeth as smoke leaked from his mouth. Doubt was the greatest weapon of them all. A wave of misery and doubt washed over Elspeth. This was her fault. If she had been a better student, less distracted with her own problems, strong enough to save Mirrodin from falling to Phyrexia, then Ajani wouldn't have been infected. Ajani landed a blow that knocked the weapon from her hand, and Elspeth could only back away. Tybalt cackled, stabbing at Tyvar, who was horrified to see Elspeth retreat. Seeing her lose her faith made him feel like all was lost. Elspeth fell back under waves of despair and doubt. She had failed. They had all failed. Ajani was lost, and her home was lost. It ripped at her, tearing away the veils of virtue and compassion she had worked for, until only her core was exposed. Ajani, seeing his opening, swung his axe at the exposed back of her neck. 
Elspeth blocked the blow from Ajani, fighting against Tybalt's lies. Tybalt turned his attention back to Tyvar, stabbing with the barbs of his tail. Tyvar grabbed one behind the stinger as the glimmer void metal spread from Tyvar's body to Tybalt, and the flesh that was left on the planeswalker's body seemed to almost pull away. Tyvar's magic suppressed whatever it touched, and Tybalt's manufactured doubts couldn't touch what it couldn't reach. Elspeth's stance grew in confidence by the moment, and as Tybalt's body was engulfed by the glimmer void metal, a pulse of hope strong enough that it felt like it should have burned the infection entirely from Phyrexia surged from her body. To Elspeth, doubt was nothing. Doubt didn't change what was right. Light blasted out from her blade, Luxior, with swirling halo encapsulated in the hilt. Elspeth slammed the hilt of her sword across the back of Ajani's neck, knocking him to the ground unconscious. She looked over to Tyvar, who assured her he could handle Tybalt. Elspeth ran to help with the Silex, and glancing back, she saw Tyvar catch Tybalt's second tail and stab him where his heart should have been. Tybalt let out an agonizing scream, and then she heard a sickening crunch after Tyvar sent the devil over the edge of the bridge. Kaya lunged for Jace, but she just stumbled through the telepath's projected image. Jace pleaded with her. Detonating the Silex might destroy the multiverse, but it also might just shake him a little bit. Kaya couldn't know that Jace was reading her mind, but it certainly felt like he was. The Jace she had known was always careful not to invade the privacy of the minds of others. Abruptly, there were three of him between Kaya and the Silex. Kaya couldn't read minds, but she could read spirit energy, and two of the Jaces didn't have spirits. She pointed out the real Jace to Kaido, who flung a handful of shuriken to stop him. As Kaido's telekinesis drove the projectiles into Jace's injured arm, the two illusions flickered and died. The waving wires on his arm resembled the tendrils of Raska's hair, and those strands started to light up at the tips. Kaido's shuriken had severed several strands, leaving them to writhe and die on the floor, and cut shallow, bloodless lines into Jace's skin. The speed of Phyrexian completion was a nightmare. They knew they had to save the multiverse to remove the Silex from the completed Jace. All the planes Phyrexia hasn't touched are connected to the Blind Eternities as well. If they blow up the tree now, they could wipe out everything. Kaido suddenly remembered the Wanderer, who was probably traveling through the Blind Eternities. Any planeswalker in transit might perish. Kaya grabbed the Silex, but she'd fallen for another of Jace's illusions. Jace looked at her from across the rim of the real Silex, still in his hands. Then he disappeared. On the other side of his illusion, Jace parted the skin of his forehead with his thumbnail. What dripped from the wound into the Silex was not blood, it was glistening oil. Jace forced his grief and fury, the suffering and sorrow, drenched agony of Mirrodin, into the bowl. Regret for the multiverse and the love of Raska. The words didn't matter, Jace knew that, but they felt right anyway. Urza had said them long ago. Tefiri had seen it, and Kaya threw him, and Jace threw her. Wipe the land clear. Bring the ending, he murmured. I'm sorry. His voice echoed in the enclosed space, impossibly loud, as light bloomed inside the bowl of the Silex, crawling upwards to the rim. Neither Kaido or Kaya saw Elspeth drop through the hole in the ceiling and race across the room towards Jace. Elspeth was confused at the scene she was witnessing. Kaido and Kaya looked concerned beyond measure, while Jace was racked with guilt. She understood the situation and acted decisively. Without hesitation, Elspeth drove her sword through Jace and shoved him aside. His body took Luxior with him as he fell and Elspeth grabbed for the Silex. As light crested over the lip of the Silex, she planeswalked bound for some unknown destination past the Blind Eternities. Tyvar dropped through the hole to join Kaido, Kaya, and Jace's slumped form. Instead of his footfall, they heard massive booms consuming all other sound. Realmbreaker's trunk pulsed with light. Each pulse lit the air with an oily, slick array of colors, yanking the world around them through a cycle of nights and days. The tree had been fully activated and was transmitting through the multiverse. The shock knocked Kaido, Kaya, and Tyvar to the floor, and in the rapidly pulsing light, none of them saw the moment when the wall irised open like an eye, allowing the smell of aether to fill the previously sealed room. Phyrexians now walked the omen path, carrying disaster with them. Each vessel with its heavy burden of Phyrexian invaders reached another plane, where they would spread their infection. An opening in the wall of the tree got larger. Footsteps coming from the other side, they were about to have company. A figure almost skeletally thin, made of red tissue and gleaming porcelain white metal, stepped into the room. 
Elish Norn turned to them and smiled, as a squadron of Phyrexian warriors slipped in after her. Kaido gasped at the sight of Tamiyo, the companion he had once fought alongside on Kamigawa, moving among them. Elish Norn welcomed them to Phyrexia as Jace's body shuddered and stood, then moved to join his new master. Luxior fell from his body, and Kaido grabbed it up quickly. Elish Norn laughed, offering them her idea of peace and harmony. Why resist? Their friends were already with her. All will be one. Her subordinates parted, letting Nahiri through. She had clearly not survived her fall. The spikes that had grown out of her neck were more pronounced now, mimicking the cloud of blades she often summoned. Her hands were gone, replaced at the elbow by metal blades. Cracks in her skin showed molten metal inside her body, and her eyes glowed with that same terrible heat. Another figure followed her on a bundle of cables, using the root-like formation of her lower body like tentacles as she settled by the other Phyrexian side. Extra appendages sprouted from the woody protrusions covering her flesh. Her face, like Tamiyo's, was marked with glistening oil. It was Nissa Ravain, but the soft-spoken animist Kayanu was gone. Elish Norn explained in her own rationality that Nahiri fought them, but was able to find peace and a better way in the One. She and Nissa came from the same place, but they were never friends. Now they're sisters, united finally on the same side in every way. They are one. Kaido, Kaya, and Tyvar could all be one. Each of them declined, and Elish Norn resigned to call them enemies. She raised her hand, clicking her perfect claws together, and the invasion began. Tafiri tried to planeswalk, but nothing happened. He tried to speed up time, but the sun didn't bend to his will. Eventually, night fell on its own accord, and Tafiri slept. He dreamt of things he wouldn't remember, but still carried with him when he wakes. He dreamt of Krug, muddy trenches filled with corpses, some fresh, some rotting, some reanimated. Then of Argoth, burning, streaked in oil, elves and humans crushed under the feet of metal beasts. He would remember some of his dreams, the cold pressure when the Phyrexians stabbed him, the dark halls of Urza's tower under siege, fire lit and chorused with agonies. His wife, Subira, didn't wander anymore. That was now his solemn duty. Tafiri awoke to see the tide had come in, though there was no moon to pull them. The landscape was illuminated in a pale blue. Tafiri had started to follow footprints leading away from the beach to a path inland. He had to find people. People must eat. People must sleep. People must laugh. All things Tafiri was desperate to find. Tafiri followed the path through a dune forest until it became a scrubland dominated by low, wide canopy trees. The sandy path gave way to packed earth, showing tracks of carts and more footprints. Tafiri bent down to use his magic to extract history from the dust. People came here once, to the beach beyond the dune forest. Parents would bring their children to spend long afternoons relaxing near the surf. Tafiri cast his mental net wider, and the visions came to him like dreams. Fishing boats lined the beach. Some of the sailors lay resting while the others headed inland to sell their catch. Making a looping gesture, he brought the past closer. Fewer families came here now, those that did stayed close and carried weapons. No sailors took their boats to sea, they were all afraid of it, afraid of the dark, afraid of what they couldn't see. Another rotation, and the past became closer. Fear, waves crashing and then horrible screams, cataclysm, the ground reached up, lurching, moving. Another rotation, and the beach was empty, only rain washing over the waves that rose to the dunes. Another rotation. The beach returned, the water now still as glass. Another rotation. At the end of this path, Tafiri's recall failed, and mist gave way to absolute darkness. It was a void, severed from time. It was Zafir. Nearly 400 years later, Tafiri was back in his home, the one he had phased out of time and reality, Zafir. Tafiri followed the path until it became a cobblestone road and hid in the bushes to watch a train of wagons pass. He was tired, hungry, thirsty, and lost. He needed to risk trust. Tafiri emerged, greeting one of the caravanners. She screamed, and the rest cried to halt and attack. Tafiri was surrounded by spear points within a minute. Tafiri was a naked traveler. He lied and said he was attacked by bandits. 
One of the caravan guards passed him a cloak, assuring him they dealt with those bandits last night. The leader of the caravan looked at him solemnly, telling him that they hadn't found his party, that none had survived. Their bodies were in the last cart, as they were taking them to Kingal. Tefiri was permitted to go along and speak for them, his fallen false colleagues. The leader introduced herself as Ashe, and Tefiri lied again, introducing himself as a traitor named Sifu, though the woman thought he looked familiar. She pointed out that he had not asked about the dead, supposedly his comrades, and then questioned him how many there were. Working quickly, he scribed to pull the answer from her memory. Tefiri found reading someone's mind wrong and invasive, but there was a need. He was able to see ten dead, and that satisfied Eshe, who promised to take care of him. The next morning, the caravan halted, a day's travel from Kingal. Guards were urging the caravaners to line up. A woman beside Tefiri explained that these were the bandits that had killed their guards and took their place, and that Eshe was their leader. Eshe hushed them as she made a slow review of the bandits' prisoners. As she reached the end of the caravan, Eshe announced that there was a snake among them. She said Zalfir was at war, and had been at war for generations. First, the Mirage War, then the Keldon War, and now this long wait preparing for the Phyrexian War. She was referring to the first Phyrexian war to defend Dominaria against Yagmoth. It never came, because Tefiri had phased out the kingdom before that catastrophic event. They had all lost so many. Everyone there, bandit or caravaner, was linked in grief. She gestured toward Tefiri, saying that there was one alone who didn't suffer, and announced him by his true name. There was shouting and gasping as guards drew their swords, and when they grabbed him, Tefiri didn't resist. Ashe lifted a spear and thrust for his heart, but Tefiri commanded time to stop. Confused, her movement was still slower than time normally elapsed. Tefiri took his time to sit down and talk to her. He told her that he had loved a caravaner once, Subira, who would later become his wife. Subira listened to him when he didn't deserve to be listened to, and that they loved each other and made a family together. She grew up on the road, and didn't lose anyone when he had sent Zalfir away in an attempt to protect it from the first Phyrexian invasion. He let Subira's love absolve him from the hurt he calls Zalfir. A love like that could save a soul, but it didn't fix the mess he made. She had passed before he could find a way to fix it. He couldn't be forgiven. He could only do what was right. He had to fix this. Tefiri let time resume as normal, asking Ashe to let him go. Now at normal speed, she told him to go away. As the caravan set off together, he walked the other direction alone. Months later, Tefiri worked as a fisherman in the river, pulling a wide net across the bank with his comrades. Labor shared, time shared. The young woman next to him introduced herself as Oyana. She already knew who Tefiri was. This work had made her strong, and she was eager to fight for her home against Phyrexia. Tefiri told her that no one was ready for Phyrexia. No one could stop them. Oyana was taken aback, moved away, and they both returned to their work. At the end of the day, Tefiri headed into the Creed Hall of the small village, a temple to the five creeds of magic. There were five guilds that served each creed for each color of magic. The Shaper Guild served blue mana. Tefiri moved towards a stone bowl in the middle of the room, stopping before the Ark of the Shaper Creed. He knelt and pressed his forehead to the edge of the bowl. The hum of mana resonated through him and thrummed up through this well and collected into the wide stone basin. Somewhere below him was a ley line. He called out for Kaya, but no answer. Tefiri was interrupted by Adia, a healer of the Civic Creed. She told him soldiers came looking for him. When Adia brought them, soldiers was a gross understatement. It was more like a war council. General Jabari walked forward, roaring a welcome to Tefiri, happy that he had found the planeswalker. Tefiri corrected him. He was just Tefiri Akosa now, not a planeswalker, apparently. The two men embraced. It had been so long since the friends had seen each other. Tefiri was back, but the sailors of their people still said there was nothing beyond the shore. Zalfir was still on its own. Tefiri began to apologize, but General Jabari stopped him. He was the Archmage of Zalfir, and Zalfir needed him. But Tefiri wasn't sure he could do anything. He didn't know how he'd gotten here. He shouldn't have been able to. Jabari told him that his Askari warriors only knew they were supposed to retrieve him, but Tefiri was not the only one from the outside to arrive. 
Jabari wanted to take him to the city of Aku, where they had a woman of regal bearing secured in amber. Before they did, the woman had asked specifically for Tafiri. Maybe it was one of his friends. Time outside this place moved differently than within it. Maybe they had fixed the temporal anchor and come to find him. Jabari described her as a young woman with white hair, wearing a golden wide-brimmed hat. Tafiri knew who it was. The Wanderer. As they readied to leave in the morning, Ida brought him robes of the Shaper Creed, so that he would look appropriate before the Queen, even if she wanted him dead for what he had done to her kingdom. Ada expressed her fear that Zulfir would either lose the war with Phyrexia or win and become a kingdom that only knew war. Tafiri explained that some things were so big that no one could stop them. He couldn't save them all like he wanted, but he could at least stand beside them. Ada begged him to protect Zulfir. He had done it before, but before he was a different, lesser person. He assured her the kingdom wasn't just about war. They weren't bound by fate, only their past. They couldn't stop what was coming, but Tafiri couldn't save Zulfir alone. But he could stand with them and help them in the aftermath. Weeks later, they arrived in Aku, the city that held the tombs of the past Zulfir royalty. The queen had come here to seek peace and spiritual guidance from her ancestors, though the amber tombs of the ancestors bristled with unsettling energy rather than peace. They walked through the corridors of Aku's main district, surrounded by patrolling Queen's Guard. They were often accompanied by someone from the Shaper Creed, or an armored cleric of the White Aligned Civil Creed. This wasn't normal, maybe something had happened in the tombs. Tafiri and Jabari reached the Amber Tombs to find the entrance crowded with soldiers and clerics, weapons drawn. Two officers, Ascari of some high seniority, argued with each other in harsh whispers. Jabari asked what happened, and the Ascari soldier told him that Karvak escaped. Karvak was a warlock who had tried to take over the kingdom of Zalfir through manipulation, eventually caught and imprisoned for his crimes. His prison had shattered, wounding General Megita, who was standing below it. The guards parted to let them travel to the central chamber of the Amber Tombs. This chamber was ancient, whispering of dark magics and rituals Zulfair's ancestors risked employing to ensure those who needed to stay locked away did. The pendulum that held Karvak had fallen on the ground and shattered, its tip still embedded into the floor. Queen Wenza stood off to the side, aged only a decade since Tafiri last saw her. She declared that 360 years had passed, and that it's still Zafir against Phyrexia. She turned to Tafiri, telling him there was no punishment great enough for the acts that he had committed. If she killed Tafiri, Phyrexia would win, and that was enough to keep him alive. She addressed Jabari, telling him he was to lead the army until General Magita recovered. The queen reached into her robes, revealing a small amber bobble, and tossed it across the floor. Tafiri picked up the small prison and peered inside. It was the Wanderer, her face going from determination to confusion. The queen told him to put the prison back on the floor, and he obeyed. One of the creed leaders stepped forward whispering a spell, and the prison began to glow. It burst open, the Wanderer's exhale echoed around the room. Tafiri filled her in while she recovered. She had been there for over a month, but for her, Tafiri had only disappeared days ago. The Wanderer's form flickered. She was losing her hold on the plane. She warned them that New Phyrexia's invasion was upon them. Nyssa was gone. Others had fallen. The Wanderer rushed to tell Tafiri about the battle at Urza's Tower, the raid on New Phyrexia, about Realmbreaker, and their desperate plan. But her voice hiccuped and stuttered. As she flickered in and out, she faded her unstable spark pulling her away. It's not too late, Tafiri said. A fierce grin spreading across his face. The Phyrexians had awoken something that their machine minds would soon learn to fear. Tafiri, who would show them all that the sun rises in Zafir. With our heroes failing in their mission to stop Elish, Norn, and New Phyrexia reaching the greater multiverse, we must now turn towards the future. What happens next? 
we can actually go back to the first part of our recap of the All Will Be One storyline, the end of the Brothers War story for a little hint. The Planeswalkers of the Gatewatch realized that failure was possible and tried to take steps to prepare for that outcome. We hear it from characters like Chandra Nalar, who reports that various planes are building up their defenses against a possible Phyrexian invasion. An invasion that's now very well underway. So at least we know a few planes won't be caught completely off guard. Our attention in the story now must turn to those planeswalkers not yet completed and serving Elish Norn, the likes of the before mentioned Chandra, the last standing original planeswalker of the Gatewatch. Tefiri, Elspeth, Kaya, Tyvar, Ren, Sahili Ray, Tezzeret, and others not really involved in the story but that we know are out there, like Garrick. It'll be up to these individuals to come together and formulate a way not only to stop the multiversal invasion, but to possibly reverse the effects the Phyrexians have on its conquered planes. The future of Magic's story will be fundamentally different from those in the recent past. When we used to just follow the actions of Planeswalkers, as they're the only ones who can travel to wherever the threat is, Elish Norn has opened the path for every non-Spark character to traverse the multiverse. The corrupted world tree Realmbreaker not only opened the doors for the Phyrexians, but everyone. Gods, dragons, students, and even deadly compliance officers. Yeah, we see you, Baral. All of these characters will have a stake in the war to come, and now they can fight together on any plane where the enemy strikes. How they will fight an enemy that seems inexhaustible is anyone's guess. Reversing those completed and possibly reversing planeswalkers completed and possibly planes lost seems even more tricky if it's possible at all. And this is where I open it up to you guys watching this video. What do you think is the solution for the Phyrexian Menace? Let me know in the comment section below. And that's going to do it for the Phyrexia All Will Be One story, guys. If you enjoyed it, consider supporting the channel by leaving it a like, becoming a subscriber, and sharing it with friends. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, see ya!